Good morning, Canaan. My name is Gary Bond. Uh, I'm the former children's pastor. Um, today I serve uh, in several of the children's ministries still. I work in Awana. Um, I work with uh, taking kids to camp each year at Camp Sanago. And uh, currently I oversee the sports program of basketball, uh, softball, and soccer. Uh, this morning we're going to be reading uh, from Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 27 through 30. Uh, if you would please stand. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that of your whole body go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Today we're going to continue in the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30 that Gary just read. Jesus takes the sin of adultery from the external action to the action in the heart and mind. Lust is a big deal and a huge sin problem in our culture today. How do we battle against lust? Today we're going to try to talk uh, practically about this. It's never a fun subject. It's not easy to preach about, especially if you know that you're going to have to preach this a week in advance um, when you have to get into your prayer closet and come before God and say, okay, Lord, uh, show me the things that I need to clean out of my own heart before I preach uh, this message. It was just a few weeks ago, um, and I think this is a good illustration for what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. And uh, we had some groceries delivered to our house. Anybody, does anybody do that, have groceries delivered to your house now? Three of you? You ought to try it. It's really awesome. It saves you a lot of time. The groceries show up. They're on the front porch. And so we're bringing the groceries into the house and setting everything into the pantry. And I was eyeballing a bag of apples because they looked really good and nice and shiny. And so I waited till we got everything in, went into the pantry, pulled open the little plastic wrap around the apples. I grabbed that shiny apple, looked at it, and took a bite, expecting a nice, crisp, juicy, sugary apple. But maybe you've done this. I was surprised because it was grainy and gross on the inside. Has anybody ever had that experience? Talk about disappointment. I learned a couple of things, right? Number one, don't let somebody else pick out your apples, okay? That's just real practical. But number two, things aren't always as they appear to be. And when Jesus talks in the Sermon on the Mount, he reminds us of the human condition. And that even though we have this veneer kind of on the outside and we can look a certain way, especially the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious people, religious people, what we can forget is that on the inside, right, even if we're born again, is still the lusts of the flesh and the desires of the flesh that will be ultimately broken from us in the consummation, but right now we still deal with. So Jesus is preaching to all of us shiny apples in the Sermon on the Mount and reminding us that when you take that bite inside, right, we're still corrupt. We still make poor decisions. We're not beautiful. Us shiny apples have a desperate need for Jesus and his righteousness. And that's what the whole Sermon on the Mount is about. So here's the big thought today. As followers of Jesus under his authority, we are to war against the sin of lust and instead walk in holiness. Now imagine for just a minute, you go to your family practice doc because you've been having a problem, right? Here's the problem. 
The problem is you're having some heart palpitations. Some of you have probably dealt with that. Has anybody dealt with that in the room? Some heart palpitations, and this keeps happening over and over again, maybe three, four times a day. It causes you to break out in a cold sweat. It gives you great anxiety, and it keeps happening. So you get into your family practice doc as soon as you can. And you sit down with your family practice doc. She says to you, she says, what's the problem? What are the symptoms? What are you going through? You say, well, here's the deal. My family has a long history of heart problems, and I've noticed that Every day now, three, four times a day, my heart just starts to beat really fast. I got this little Fitbit, and it's, it's registering like 160, 170. It's freaking me out. I'm having anxiety, and I'm breaking out in a cold sweat. So you sit down with your doctor, and she says, okay, I got just what you need. Here it is. She pulls out of an office drawer. She pulls out a nice new towel. She says, every time you start to sweat, just wipe off your brow. And I have some anti-anxiety medicine, so just take that. She says, We'll see you later. Say, hold on, just a minute. Would that bother anybody? Now, I have, a, I have a whole history, a family problem with heart disease. And many people have died in my family from heart attacks. Like, I, I need help with the heart. Shouldn't you send me to a cardiologist? He said, nope, just take the anti-anxiety medicine. And every time you start to sweat, just wipe off your brow. Would that bother anybody? Would you go back to that doctor? No. Because what you need is a cardiologist to diagnose what the problem is so that you can get to the heart of the matter. Well, here's the deal. Jesus rips off the Band-Aid in the Sermon on the Mount, and he demonstrates to all of us, guess what? We got heart issues. And those heart issues are in our family line. They go all the way back to our first parents. But if we attack the heart issues in the wrong way, guess what? We're never gonna get the healing that we need. And so it's important for us to look at the Sermon on the Mount, get to the heart of the issue, and fix the real problem, which is the heart. And so outward religious expressions and those kind of ideas that maybe just fix the external, they're not gonna do it with Jesus. It's the inward man. We all have heart issues. We have to get to the heart of the issue. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members and that your whole body go into hell. Father, we just pray that today you would teach us from your word, that we would take Jesus' words very seriously, Lord, and know that we are sin sick, that our hearts are sick without you. Even after being born again, Lord, we know Paul talks about the battle with the flesh, that the spirit and the flesh really do battle, that good Christian people who love you, who have trusted in the cross and the resurrection, still fall into sin. We think of King David. We think of men down through the ages that have struggled with this issue. I think of my own life, Lord, and I'm grateful for the cross, but I know, Lord, at the end of the day, we have to address this issue in the right way, and that is by giving our heart to you, Lord. I know people are dealing with this issue right here in this congregation. This group is way too big. A lot of people here are dealing with this issue today, so I pray that your word would minister to their hearts that you'd speak to us in Jesus' name, amen. First of all, when it comes to today's topic, if you struggle with lust, then you are not alone. But it is also one of the loneliest sins to deal with because no one can see it. And all of us struggle with it to different extremes. I remember the first time that I came across pornography. I was nine or 10 years old, and um, I was with a friend and what we were doing is uh, his, his, this friend, his dad, had like a little lawn mowing business. And so he was putting us to work. I was just a little guy, but he handed me a weed eater and he said, here's how you use it. Use this weed eater. And he says, go back behind these apartments and weed eat. And so I'm just learning. I'm all excited because I can run this little machine. And I was pretty tall for my age, so I was strong, able to do it. And I'm back in this corner behind these apartments and I'm weed eating along the edge, and I weed eat, and I hit something, and I see all these flakes kind of jump into the air, and I was like, well, what's that? So I put the weed eater down, and I look, 
And down there, kind of buried off to the side, somebody had a stash of Playboy magazine. So I took it, I opened it up, and I was like, ooh, whoa. You know, I was like nine or 10. I walked away, I was like, wow, that was really weird. So I got my weed eater, I started weed eating again, and I was like, maybe I should look again, right? So I go back over to it, and what I did not, rele- what I did not realize in that moment was, right, that that curiosity and the way God had wired me as a human being was that there was actually, and I'm gonna talk about this more in a few minutes, a release of dopamine into my system, a pleasure chemical that drew me back to it so that I wanted to look at it some more. And at 10 years old, right, the battle with lust began in my young heart, a little kid who hadn't even hit puberty yet. Your story may be similar, but you need to know that the consumption of porn comes with physiological changes inside a person's body. And consuming it makes it incredibly difficult to stop whenever I found out, just as a nine or 10-year-old kid, that it was hard then not to want to go back and see that again. That image caused my brain to release dopamine into my system, which is the body's way of telling you that you enjoy something. It's a chemical in your body for enjoyment and pleasure, and get this, it was created as a good thing that God meant to be shared right in the bedroom between a husband and a wife. The dopamine itself and the release of that dopamine is not a bad thing in its given context, just like a fire belongs in a fireplace, right? Sex belongs in the bedroom between a husband and a wife. But that dopamine told me this is good. Do more of this. You love this feeling. This system that tells you of pleasure and wants this action is called your limbic system. But you also have a balancer in your body. God's made this natural balancer called the prefrontal cortex. It's the seat of rational thinking, logic, impulse control. But what happens over time as you give in more and more to the impulses of your body for that dopamine to be released through pornography, what happens is a rewiring to where your prefrontal cortex weakens as the limbic system gains power over it. That's where addiction comes from. Does that make sense? That can happen with alcohol. That can happen with drugs. That can also happen with pornography. For the young men in this room, young women, you're not alone if you struggle with the issue of lust. St. Augustine, the most famous Bible theologian the first thousand years of the church, struggled horribly with lust. At one point in time, he said, God, make me chaste, but not yet. He was just honest about his struggle. And what happened is over time, as God transformed his heart and his life, he became a monk. He, he went uh, the, to the opposite extreme because he knew it was creating all this issue with himself and his relationship with God. He was with a woman who he wasn't married to for 15 years. He had a child out of wedlock. This is, again, the greatest theologian the church has known in the first thousand years. But when he was able to finally get a hold of it and lay it out before God, this became his favorite verse. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Proverbs 28, verse 13. What did he do? He wrote a book called Confessions, his spiritual autobiography, where he wrote it all on paper. He got it out there. Concealing sin issues of the heart by polishing the outside of the apple only rot the inside more quickly. When I was a kid, I heard this said many times. Maybe you've heard this before. You know, really, you can look at the menu all you want. You just can't order. Has anybody heard that? That's, that's what people told me. You can look at the, the woman. You can look at her all you want. You just can't order off the menu. Now that sentiment doesn't even begin to address what Jesus says is the real problem. It's carnal. It's a carnal way of looking at things. A man can't just casually be talking about the beauty of a woman that's not his wife in the man cave or on the golf course like it's no big deal. It is a big deal because our hearts are sick. You shouldn't be looking at the menu to begin with, men. The scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day were no different from us today, putting on a show on the outside like there was no internal battle going on on the inside. 
Jesus says, first, we must address the inner man. I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has committed adultery with her in his heart. Sin always starts in the hearts and manifests itself in our actions, if you're taking notes. Sin always starts in the hearts and manifests itself in our actions. Jesus tells us last week, the murderer was angry first. The part you couldn't touch, the anger manifested itself in the part you could touch, murder. Adultery, according to Jesus, and any kind of fornication for that matter, right? It started first with lust. The part you couldn't touch, the lust, manifested in the part you could touch, adultery. It all starts internally and works its way externally. Job understood this. In Job chapter 31, verse 1, he said this, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Notice he didn't make a covenant that he wouldn't look at another human being of the other sex, but that he wouldn't look with lustful intention. Job understood it was the heart of the matter that mattered. In order to not look lustfully, it's the lust that has to be cleaned out of the inner man. We have to look at people, right? We don't, as born-again believers, have to look at people lustfully. The lustful look comes from deep inside of us where we've either laid that part before the Lord, and if we haven't, there's all kinds of spiritual weeds growing up all over our hearts. In Bruce Metzger's great book, Backgrounds of New Testament, he talks about the Pharisees of Jesus' day. And the Pharisees of Jesus' day, they would do these outward acts in front of men to appear holy. And one of these groups of Pharisees were nicknamed the bleeding-headed Pharisees. If you've never heard of these guys, the bruised or bleeding-headed Pharisee, in order to avoid looking at a woman, would shut his eyes, stumble up against a wall, and bleed out of his head. I'm sure it looked really pious. But the problem is, you and I both know we can shut our eyes and still lust. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. Listen, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside also may be clean. The issue is that we have brokenness in all of our desires. The Greek word here that Jesus used for, for lust is the word epithumia. And it's the same word that's used. Listen to this carefully. It's the same word that's used in Romans chapter one. And if you remember anything about Romans chapter one, it's all about sexual immorality, homosexuality, people leaving the natural desire, women leaving the, leaving the natural desire for the man and going after women and men going after men and all this sexual stuff, this sexual sin is full of it. And listen to what it says in Romans chapter one, verse 24, where this word epithumia, lust, is used. It says this, Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves. Do you hear that? He gave them up. It may be one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture. He gave them up to just do what they wanted to do. Sexual sin all throughout history it comes in many forms, many fashions, many ways, but it is one of the worst sins that exists out there. It tears a person from the inside out. It breaks all relationships. It breaks up families. It breaks up churches. It tears things apart when it's done outside of the plan that God has given us. God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves. Don't think for a moment that our culture isn't filled with people that God hasn't already given up to the evils of sexual immorality. Pervasive internet pornography is one of the worst evils that has spread all the way across the world. And the simple fact is with pornography, here's the weird thing about it, right? Is that you really don't know what you're seeing. You don't really know. Missouri Baptist Children's Home tells us that in America today, there's between, we're not exactly sure on the numbers, between 100,000 and 300,000 girls 
that are being sex trafficked right now in America, between 100,000 and 300,000. The average age of a sex trafficked girl, listen to me, is between the ages of 12 and 14. Much of that content is uploaded to the internet. In fact, there's a lot of lawsuits that are going on right now because it's been found out that some of the content that's out there that's being consumed by people is of underage trafficked girls. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're slaves. And this stuff is everywhere. Now, that's not to mention the fact that that stuff happens all over the world where there's no controls, right? That's just in America. In fact, the Children's Home also tells us this, that within the first 48 hours of a young girl who has left her home, maybe she's a runaway, within the first 48 hours, one-third of those girls are already being sex trafficked. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 27 through 29 says this. I want you to think of this. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. According to Jesus, when it comes to lust, we must be ready to do the radical to purge it. Radical action is required to avoid temptation. Verses 29 and 30 says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Can you imagine that? For it's better to lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Like, picture that. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. The language Jesus uses here is significant. He talks about the right hand and the right eye. The right is the place of honor in Hebraic culture. Jesus sits around the table with his disciples. The first person to be honored is the person on his right. The next best person in that situation or that is honored is the next person to the right, and so on and so forth, until you get to the least honored in the room. In fact, the name Benjamin means son of the right hand. It's the, he's the blessed son in the family. What is Jesus telling us to do? To be willing to throw away that which is the best of us in order to stop this sin from overtaking our life. Get rid of it. Why? Because to lose something temporary in this life is no big deal compared to eternity in hell. Jesus' point is that radical action should be taken to fight against lust. The early church father, Origen, um, he wanted to teach young ladies the Bible, and he struggled with lust, and even went to, to such lengths as he castrated himself so that he could be in the room teaching young ladies the Bible. Now listen to me, only to find out, only to find out that that didn't really fix the problem. So Jesus isn't really telling you to cut out your eyes and your hand, okay? That's hyperbole. And poor Origen found out the hard way, amen? You, you can laugh. There's just very little laughing in today's sermon, but that's one of them. I'm sorry. What a painful external change to the body to only find out, well, I still lust. We should be ready to make drastic action to rid ourselves from the problem of lust. The problem is that issues like lust can't totally be gotten rid of by changing external things around us. I don't know, has anybody seen that movie with Kirk Cameron? It's called Fireproof. It's a really good movie. It came out a few years ago. Raise your hand if you saw Fireproof. There's a great scene in it. So his marriage is getting torn apart for, for many issues. There's a lot of stuff going on between him and his wife. But one of the issues that she doesn't know is going on is that he's hooked on internet porn. And so there's these moments of time uh, during the movie where he's sitting at the He's sitting at the uh, computer screen, he's looking at it, and there's this opportunity for him to be tempted. He's got his hand on the mouse, and he's like, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna click it and do this or not? And he keeps going back and forth, and, and he's having this trouble because he wants to have this relationship with his wife, but this is one of those things that's creating the barrier, right? That's an invisible barrier to her, but he knows it's there, and it's keeping him from being intimate in the way that he needs to be with his wife. And so there's this scene, it's actually a funny scene, it's a really good scene, where he takes his computer outside. Does anybody remember where I'm going with this? And he gets a baseball bat, do you remember? And he just starts beating the tar out of this computer. 
And you're like, in that moment, you're like, yes, right? And it's funny, it pans over and there's this old man and this old woman watching him like, what are you doing, right? But he went to some like extremes for the outward issue to be solved or remedied. He knew he couldn't stop. And so what did he do? He took this external thing. Now listen to me. That works pretty good. That's a pretty good solution. If taking out the external came from a heart that was changed, but if it didn't come from a heart that was changed, guess what? We can always go back to Best Buy and buy another computer. Do you understand what I'm saying? If the heart hasn't really changed, the external stuff doesn't really matter. The Greek word here translated for hell is Gehenna. It comes from the Aramaic word referred to the Hinnom value, sorry, the Hinnom Valley. That is where people used to sacrifice their children to the false god Molech. Eventually, this place was in the southwest corner of Jerusalem. It was perpetually on fire. It was a trash dump, but it was also known as a place where idolatry happened. A good picture of what hell is actually like according to Jesus. There are some basic external things that you can put in place. Now we get to the practicals to help with this situation, but we're gonna come back to something at the end. Martin Luther once said this, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from building a nest in your hair. Right? Amen? Somebody else say amen. Come on. You guys are with me? You are surrounded, men, by beautiful women. <laughs> that brother's sitting by his wife. That, that a boy. That a boy. You want to come finish this? <laughs> That's great. You are surrounded, women, by handsome men. Amen? Okay? Okay? Birds are flying over our heads all the time, but we don't have to dwell on them as objects. If you're a believer, you have the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, and here's what the Bible tells us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Do you believe that? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And there are some basic strategic steps, steps that you can take to help yourself with external things. Number one, be careful of the movies that you allow yourself to watch. Don't consume content that has nudity in it you'll begin to crave it if you spend time looking at it. The outside world is where the devil is hard at work, constantly trying to pierce through the strength of your inner man and woman. Remember what happens chemically in your body when you look at nudity. And don't pretend like, oh, well, this is just art. Come on, like seriously? Be honest with yourselves about who we are. If you don't have a biblical worldview, you can't expect the world to, but if you have a biblical worldview and you know of your shortcomings, then just take precaution and just know, like, this is an R-rated movie. Listen, I, Amy and I, we, this was not too long ago, and it was a complete accident, but I didn't use wisdom. I love studying history. Some of you in the room know that. I love studying World War II. I love studying the Manhattan Project. And so we went to the movie Oppenheimer. It was rated R, but I was like, well, of course it's rated R. It's a nuclear bomb, you know what I'm saying? And I'm thinking, it's probably gonna show images from Japan and things like that. Well, guess what? There's a nude scene in there that I had no idea about it. And her hand went across my face so fast and hard, I'm still sore right on the bridge of my nose, you know what I'm saying? Seriously, be because she knows me, I don't need to be consuming that or looking at that stuff. Complete accident, but I should have used more wisdom. That's on me. That's on me. Be careful about what you let yourself see. Young men, find another young man your age that loves Jesus and can help you keep accountable regarding the things you put in front of your face or your struggles. And I don't wanna hear this. Oh, I don't really have a problem with that. Listen, there was a guy not too long ago. He works with college kids all over the world. He's a great guy. He's a good friend of mine. Um, Brandon Benefield introduced me to this guy. He does a lot of mentoring of young men. And he told me now when he works with a college student on campus, he does not say, he does not say this to them. Are you struggling with porn? 
he says to them, his first words are, how bad is your struggle with porn? You understand what I'm saying? The apologist Josh McDowell says this. He says that the worst thing the church is dealing with today, now this is a guy who's an apologist. He studied the cults, the world religions for his whole life. He studied liberalism, and he tells us the worst thing the church is dealing with today is not cults or world religions. He said it's pervasive internet porn. That's the destroyer. What happens is we keep that inside. It creates all this guilt and this shame. And I'm kind of wondering now, like when we look at our universities and we don't see many kids, young men who, who feel called to be pastors and leaders and evangelists and teachers, if, if the problem is they're so full of shame and guilt and regret that they think God could never use me and they're keeping this stuff inside instead of surrendering it to the Lord and surrendering to the Lord for ministry, right now we have no leaders out there to plant churches. Number three, get internet protections on all of your devices if you don't already have them and get them ASAP. You are not 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Number four, to the single, God has given us marriage. Stop waiting. Stop looking at porn and commit to another human being. Marriage is a remnant of Eden. Do you hear me? Marriage is a remnant of Eden. Think of everything that was lost in the fall, but God in his kindness and goodness allowed marriage to be preserved for us today. Isn't that grace? Oh my goodness. Get married. First Corinthians chapter seven, Paul says this, to the unmarried and widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Number five, to husbands and wives, live a life full of commitment and sex in marriage. Husbands and wives in the room, fulfill your sexual commitments and obligations to one another. Fulfill them. We have commitments and obligations. First Corinthians 7 is a great place to start. It says, man, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your wife. Women, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your husband. Our bodies belong to the other. And number six, remember that Jesus' language here is hyperbole. Don't anybody do what Origen did. Cutting out your eyes or cutting off your hand won't cure your problem with lust. A blind man can lust. Amen? You know, it's interesting. Sometimes we look at other cultures, and I, I've heard this before because I get to travel in and out of other cultures. Uh, in this last year, I've been to several cultures around the world doing mission work um, for this Wonderful church here to kind of make connections in different places. Uh, and it wasn't too long ago, I was in Ethiopia, and uh, it was late at night, and I finally got to bed about midnight. We got in late from this plane, and it was just a layover, but I had to stay the night in Ethiopia, and at 3.40 in the morning, the call to prayer starts in Ethiopia. I'm just trying to get some sleep. You guys know what the call to prayer is? It's this Islamic chant that's reminding everybody to get up and start praying at 3.40 in the morning. Sounds really pious, right? And also in Islam, you've probably seen this before, and I've seen this in a lot of different cultures, modesty is a big thing, okay? Modesty. And women in Islamic culture will wear a burqa. Have you guys ever seen a burqa before? You've heard of a burqa, right? It covers up everything except maybe just the little eye slits. Sometimes they even have a veil over their face, but not even the hands can show of really, really conservative Muslim men, because they don't want to lust, and they want their wives to be modest. So they force them to wear these really hot things. They even wear gloves, can't see the hands, anything in some of these cultures. So everything is completely covered except maybe the eye slits. And we look at that and we say, wow, that is really amazing. They have this much self-control. Not too long ago, I'm watching a documentary on SEAL Team, SEAL Team 6. SEAL Team 6 are the ones who went in and killed Osama bin Laden. You remember the story? The terrorist Osama bin Laden. And this great, pious Islamic leader, you know what they find all over his hard drives? Porn. Nobody, right? Nobody is vaccinated from this problem. No culture, no people. And even if everybody, all the women in here were in burqas, guess what, guys? We would still have a problem. Because the problem 
is really, again, in the heart. It always comes back to the heart. If you do the external things without actually having a heart change, it will never work. And this is where we're gonna end today because this is all the Sermon on the Mount here. So get ready. We must desire above all things to be with God. For our hearts to be with God. Psalm 27 verses four and five says this. This is beautiful. This is David. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Why is David talking about a a tent? Why is he talking about a temple? Because inside the tent of meeting, right, the tabernacle, that eventually became the temple is where God's presence was at. He wants to be with God because he knows where God is. He feels pure and he feels connected. Isn't it amazing that in the New Testament with Jesus, the busiest man on the planet for three years during his public ministry, that he always makes time to get alone with his father? Everybody's looking for him. Where'd Jesus go? Well, he's up on that mountain praying before everybody gets up. He's connecting. He's communing with God. He's giving himself to his father. That's what David wanted, to be in the temple where the mercy seat was at, where God invisibly dwelled so that his heart could be connected with God. Where does he want to be? Where God dwells. In our culture today, we're rarely even quiet enough in life to listen and to hear in communion. I know some of you probably ache for that, don't you? When I don't have it for a while, I really just ache for it. Oh man, I'm just, I'm too busy. I have got to get alone with God where I can just connect. It's like I have no power, right? It's like trying to run a vacuum without it being plugged into the wall. There's just nothing there if I don't commune with the living God. We've got to wrestle in our prayer closet. B, we must beg God to continuously create in us a clean heart. The context of Psalm 51, again, King David, is he's committed adultery with Bathsheba. He has wrecked his family, right? Right? He's on the verge of wrecking his kingdom. It's gonna lead to a lot of trouble in the future of his kingdom with his sons and his friendships and everything else. And in the middle of this, he asked God for mercy. Have mercy on me according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Here's what he says to God. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin for I know my my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Do you feel like this today? Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin and in my mo- in sin, my mother conceived me. But listen to this. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now, you may read that at surface glance and you're just like, well, that's really a cool kind of poetic language and everything else, but, but I want you to listen to me. In the Hebrew language, there's four words for create or build or make. There's the Hebrew word asa, the Hebrew word yatsar, and the Hebrew word bana. And all of those words can mean to build or to construct something, and both God and men can be the subject the ones actually doing the acting, the building. So Yatsar, Bana, Asa. All those can be used of God or men. And it refers to materials that are already there that we can kind of take and fashion and create with our own hands. But that's not the word that David uses here when he says, create in me a clean heart. He uses the Hebrew word, bara. Everybody say bara. Bara. And bara is the same word that's used in Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bara is something where God is the subject, only God. Man cannot bara. And here's what it means. It means 
Not out of materials that already exist as he fashion, form, or build something, but it means there's nothing there. It's like the creation of the universe, ex nihilio. Out of nothing, God created something new. You see the word that David used in its significance in the context? He's broken. Create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Bara refers to a new beginning. David is asking God to give his heart a new beginning. And God granted that to David. There are some of you in the room today that need a new beginning. We must live a lifestyle of communion with God that leads to confession, repentance, and holiness. United Pursuit sings a song called The Simple Gospel. And I love this line. There's a couple lines in it that are beautiful. Some of the words go, I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I'm laying down all my religion. I just want to know you, Lord. I reach out and you find me in the dust. And you say no amount of untruths can separate us. I will rejoice in the simple gospel. I will rejoice in you, Lord. One Puritan writer prayed this. Oh God, I know that I often do your work without your power and sin by my dead, heartless, blind service. My lack of inward light, love, delight, my mind, heart, tongue moving without your help. I see sin in my heart and seeking the approval of others. This is my vileness to make men's opinion my rule. Whereas I should see what good I have done and give you glory. Consider what sin I have committed and mourn over it. It is my deceit to preach and pray and stir up other spiritual affections in order to beget commendations where my rule should be daily to consider myself more vile than any man in my own eyes. I've been spending a lot of time in the Psalms. In 2023, I read through the Psalms real carefully, and I've been back in the Psalms again. I've just kind of really re-fell in love with the Psalms. The other day, I was in Psalm 13, and um, I want to end with this Psalm. And if you would, I just want you to close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to listen to this psalm because this could be your prayer this morning. The psalms are beautiful because they, many of them are prayers. Dealing with a difficult situation, in David's life. Think of Psalm 3 when his son's chasing him. Think of all the different things that are going on. But in this psalm, there's real trouble in David's heart. He needs to know that God is going to be there. And I want you just to close your eyes and I'm going to read this. And maybe this psalm can become your prayer this morning. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? Are you dealing with internet porn? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? and day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. Ah, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Is that your prayer this morning? If you would, please stand. The altar is open. If you want to come and pray, we're going to have prayer counselors down here in the front. I want you to have the opportunity to clean your heart this morning.